Okay, so everyone. Very good Arab Shabbat. As you are all aware, this uh, Shabbat is uh, our Shad Zachor. Our Shad Zachor has a special Haftorah that goes with it, that overrides the regular Haftorah of Ayikra. And it's the Haftorah of Shmuel Anovi and of Shol Melech Yisrael. <coughs> it's a very dramatic Haftorah, but it contains within it uh, great uh, lessons, uh, really guidelines uh, as to uh, Jewish life and the future of the Jewish people. The Gemara says, Shlosha mitzvos nitztavu Yisrael v'chnisos on Lawrence. When Jewish people came to the land of Israel, so there were three mitzvot that were reserved for them to accomplish. The first one is Losim Aleya Melech to appoint a king, the leader of the people. The Torah, there's a mitzvah, Som Tosim Aleich Melech. Melech has uh, many different definitions. We're not accustomed to kings anymore. And those kings who exist are only titular in nature, the constitutional monarchs. But the Melech that the Torah had in mind is someone who has real power. So one mitzvah was to appoint such a Melech. Second mitzvah was Mechias Amolek, to destroy the nation of Amolek. Now Amolek then was a recognizable, identified tribe that lived in the uh, uh, northeast quadrant of Eretz Israel. Near uh, uh, present day, we would say the Golan, Syria, and that area. And they were a specific tribe, a specific nation, descended from Esau. And uh, they were the antithesis of the Jewish people all of the centuries. On Purim, we'll read uh, the Torah reading. Uh, when the Jewish people left Egypt, the Amalek immediately came to destroy them. So the Mitzvah of Mechias Amalek, the eradication, the destruction of Amalek. The Rambam points out that in our time, uh, there is no identifiable Amalek. So Amalek in our time has become a symbol, not a geographic location, nor an identifiable group of people. So we say that all Rishoyim, so to speak, are uh, part of Amalek. And the job of eradicating Amalek is eradicating evil in the world. But in the time of the Tanakh, eradicating Amalek was very specific. It was obvious uh, what was meant. The third mitzvah that the Torah says is to build the Beit HaMikdash. 
Now, it's interesting. We don't find in the Torah per se the mitzvah of building a Beit HaMikdash. We find the, uh, we read the five uh, parshas in the Torah about building the Mishkan. The Mishkan existed in Shiloh for over 350 years. So the Jewish people were uh, in the land of Israel for many, many centuries without building a Beit HaMikdash. Yet uh, the Gemara seems to think that there was a mitzvah to build the Beit HaMikdash. So the Mephorshim explain that the, the mitzvah is uh, obviously a contingent upon the fact that there are other mitzvahs like Ali Ola Regel, and it says that there will be a place Asher Yivchar Hashem Elokech. The Rabboni Sholem Kaviyocho will choose a place in Eretz Israel, and that's where uh, his Shechina, so to speak, will dwell. His presence will physically be tangibly experienced, and uh, that doesn't happen till the time of David Amelech. At this time, when the Jews came there to Israel, there were large sections of the country that remained not under Jewish control. Well, one of them was that the, the area of the city of Yerushalayim was uh, a fortress of the Yavusi, one of the uh, seven tribes. And that for hundreds of years, the Jewish people are in the country and they never occupied this place. They remained the fortress of the Jebusites. So we have these three mitzvahs that, the, that are supposed to speak incumbent upon us. Now, how do we understand those three mitzvahs? Are all three to be done at once? In other words, the king, you appoint the king so that you'll be able to destroy Amalek. And if you destroy Amalek, then you'll be able to build the Beit HaMikdad. Or is it three separate inyonim completely? Three separate subject matters completely. And the, the Mephorshim say that this was part of the uh, misunderstanding that exists in the Haftorah between Shoal and between Shmuel. Now, a Shoal Amelech is an unwilling king. He hides from being a king. In fact, he's unaware of Shmuel Anovi. Tanakh tells us that uh, his father uh, had a herd of donkeys that got lost, and he sent Shoal to find them. Shoal and a companion, and they came to the city of Shmuel, which is not far from here. Some say Ram, Ram, uh, where Ramot is here, the Ramat Shmuel. And uh, they come to ask the Novi to find the donkeys, where they should look, which is a strange uh, thing in itself. That's what you need a Novi for. 
you lost the donkey, so you have, but that's the way it is. That's human nature. The Kotzkers often said, I want to uh, raise them to the level of heaven, and they want that I should bless them, that their cow should give more milk. So uh, Shmuel comes into the city. I'm going to show comes into the city. And he knows that Shmuel lives there. So he stops somebody on the street and he says, Ayeye where is the prophet? Ahose, the seer. <laughs> he didn't realize that he stopped Shmuel Anovi himself. So Shmuel says to him, I'm the seer. It's a very strange introduction of Shoal to Shmuel. We would have thought that uh, they would have uh, met uh, regarding all sorts of uh, spiritual and esoteric matters. And the Rabboni Shon tells Shmuel that Shoal should be the king. Um, Shoal is from the tribe of Binyamin. Yaakov gave the blessing of Malucha to Yehuda. So then why should Shoal be the king? And Shoal senses that. Shoal all of his life senses that somehow he's not the legitimate king. And that colors his behavior. So originally he, he hides, he doesn't want to become the king at all. But uh, Shmuel searches him out and proclaims him to be the king. And the people rally behind him. And that's the, uh, where the Haftorah begins. The Gemara says, famous Gemara, the Biesi said that in the, in the beginning he said, I did not want to be appointed to the Sanhedrin. I didn't want to be a, any official role. I ran away from it. But now that I was once appointed, he said, wild horses can't drag me down again. It's the nature of power, the nature of office. So even though Shoal is reluctant, he will spend his entire reign almost in a paranoid manner to defend the fact that he is the king of Israel. That's his whole confrontation with David Amelech. He's willing to kill David. <coughs> Even though by now David has been proclaimed already by Shmuel to be uh, Shoal's successor and the true king of Israel. So now Shmuel comes to Shoal and he says, In other words, we accomplished the first mitzvah, we made you the Melech. Now the job of the Melech is to accomplish the other two mitzvahs. And it's supposed to happen, so, so to speak, uh, in a relatively simultaneous fashion. 
one package. And therefore, uh, he uh, is entrusted with uh, the war against Amalek to destroy Amalek. And that included destroying the cattle, the animals uh, that Amalek had, the herds. On the ancient world, that was the, uh, it was the wealth, it was the means of uh, barter. Supposed to destroy all the cattle. Shoal conducts a successful campaign and he destroys Amalek. The army is completely decimated of Amalek. No one survives. But he does not destroy the cattle. Because the uh, Jewish army, Jews themselves, said that, why should we destroy the cattle? And he doesn't kill the king of Amalek, Agog. Now there's a machlekes in the Gemara that seems uh, that uh, the opinion of most of uh, the scholars was that we did not accept converts from Amalek. However, in Tanakh, we find by Dovin Amalek that there was a gear that was Amaleki. So it was a question whether or not Amalek uh, is so irredeemable that you cannot even have a convert from Amalek. Shmuel lets it happen. I'm, I'm sorry, Shoal lets it happen. Agog is alive and uh, the cattle is alive. And to a great extent, uh, he's unaware that he's done anything wrong. He thinks he did the right thing. Shmuel has a vision, and the Lord tells him that uh, the show is uh, to be fired. He didn't do the job. And that uh, the uh, Malchus should be given over to someone else. Can't show was not up to the task. And Shmuel has to go and inform Shoal of that good news. And Shmuel Anovi is uh, the greatest of the Nevi'im after Moshe. That's what we say, Moshe Avaram B'chol Anov, Shmuel B'chol Shmo. So Shmuel goes and he finds Shoal. Shoal sees Shmuel. So he says, good that you came. Akimosi is Hashem. I did what God told me. I defeated Amalek. I destroyed its army. It will never rise again. I did my job. Shmuel doesn't uh, agree. Shmuel says, How come I hear all of the cattle? You'll hear tomorrow at the Malkore. We'll uh, 
imitate the bleeding of the sheep. What is that noise that I hear? So Shoal says, uh, oh, the, the, we, we kept some of the cattle because we want to give korbonos Lashem. We want to give uh, sacrifices to God. So uh, some of the cattle is still alive because we're going to use it for a noble purpose, a mitzvah, something good. It's the... Uh, classic example of the thief who gives 10% to Zdoka. So that justifies the thievery because he's doing a mitzvah with the money. Shmuel doesn't uh, agree to that. And he chastises him and he tells him, you will no longer be the king. The shoal is bereft. So he gives another excuse. The first excuse is a pious one. He's going to do a charity with it. He's going to bring korbanos with it. has to show them that there's a selfish motive here. But when Shmuel refuses to accept that excuse, he says, Eurasia, uh, so listen, uh, I did what the people wanted. I was afraid of the people. I'll tell them that the uh, they fought a war and they will have no uh, material benefit. They won't capture anything. I was afraid of their reaction. So they had to let them have the cattle. Otherwise, uh, they, they would depose me, if not to do something even worse. Shmuel doesn't buy that either. Shmuel, Shmuel tells him is that the, the Boni Sholem chose you to be the Melech. Be a Melech. Don't tell me I'm afraid of the people. Now there's always a fine line between leadership and between the popularity with the people. And uh, that exists uh, certainly in politics, but it exists, for instance, uh, in the rabbinate or in other areas of Jewish life. You can't be a chief without Indians. You know, famous story that uh, Chosid once came to the Rebbe to a Rebbe, and he said, I had a dream last night, and in the dream I became a great Rebbe. And the Rebbe said to him, you had the dream, the chassidim have to have the dream, not you. They have to have the dream that you're the great Rebbe. So Shaul said, you're atheist, so I was afraid of the people. Want to be popular? Shmuel says that's not your job. So we have show fails on that account. And we have later Shlomo Melech has a son, Rechavim. And the uh, people come to him with certain requests. And he uh, 
listens to the wrong advisors, and he tells the people, my father whipped you with whips of leather, I will whip you with whips of scorpions. I'm going to show you. So what happened is 10 tribes broke off and they made Malchus Israel under Yeruvim ben Nevot and the, the, that uh, one of the great disasters in Jewish history. So on one hand, the problem is Eurasia Sohom. And on the other hand, if it's uh, too much Eurasia Sohom, uh, it's a disaster. So that's a very fine line. And that's really the measure of a leader. Because I will say uh, in their inimitable fashion that any Talmud Chochem or Rov in a community that all the people like him is not doing his job. It's too much, it's your race here, so on. on the other hand, cannot lead the people if they don't want to be led, if they don't have any respect or trust in the leader. We uh, saw Salanter said the famous uh, quip. I don't know if it really applies in our time. I don't think it does anymore. But in his time, perhaps it did. That the community that uh, doesn't uh, appreciate its rabbi. He said it's, it's, it's a reflection that the rabbi is not what he should be. So this is uh, the, the, the dividing line. And there's one more dividing line in this week's uh, Aftora. The difference between Shoal and David. Both sin. <clears throat> Both violated a precept that the Lord told them. Both, therefore, were confronted by a novi. Shoal is confronted by Shmuel. David is confronted by God, the novi. And not son of God. Shoal denies that he did anything wrong. He has all sorts of excuses, as I mentioned. David Amelech says immediately, You're right, I have sinned. It's difficult for a king to admit that he's wrong, that he made a mistake, because it has national consequences. And therefore, everybody tries to rationalize errors to excuse mistakes. But a king is not allowed to do that. The king uh, has to say chatosi. And he has to say so immediately when the Navi explains it to him. So that's why Yishol did not survive. So to speak, he didn't have a second chance. Shmuel ripped the garment. The, the garment of Shmuel is ripped by Yishol. He, he tore it off of him because of his behavior. Well, David HaMelech not only survived, but is enhanced by it. We say in Davening every day, Tachnun. I'm sorry, sorry what I did.
‫אנחנו בחרנו נחותוסי לפניך. ‫So every day we recount ‫דוד המלך סין. ‫נברלס, ‫אז דוד מלך ישראל חי וכיום. ‫דוד is eternal, ‫דוד זה מלך המשיח. ‫דוד הוא בין הוואן, ‫through his uh, offspring, ‫that the Beit HaMikdash will be built. ‫אז אנחנו רואים שזה באמת ‫הדבר הראשון. ‫וזה דבר קשה לעשות. ‫כל הפרקים נפגשים בו. ‫יש איזו אנגדות יהודית ‫שאיזה סרקס הגיע לטעם. And they were supposed to perform that night, and the trapeze artist was ill, and he was unable to do his act. So they put an ad in the paper, "We need a trapeze artist for tonight. Anybody, you know, thousand dollars. There's a poor Jew in town who could use the thousand dollars. So he comes and he says, uh, yeah, you know, they said, you know how to perform on the trapeze? You know, yeah, sure, I'm an expert. So the time comes and they dress him up in the costume and they take him, you know, 300 feet in the air and they swing the trapeze and he's paralyzed, he can't move. And the again, guy on the bottom says, listen, jump, jump. So he says, he said in Yiddish, it's much better than in English, but it's, he said, uh, I'm not jumping, he said, but how in the world do I crawl down from here? Three Christmen are up from down, and how do you get out of this? That's always the problem when you make a mistake. How do you get out of it? So the first method of getting out of it is admitting that it was a mistake. And that's the hardest part. That's the hardest part to do. So all of that appears in this week's Haftorah. And the irony is that uh, the story of Purim is uh, Agog. is that the Haman is a descendant of Agog, of Amalek, and Mordechai is a descendant of Shaul, Yishimini from the tribe of Yemen, Esther. So it plays itself out again. So Ahasuerus is a weak king, And so you raise your soul, you can bribe him, all sorts of things happen. Today it's a uh, woman, and tomorrow uh, he'll make Mordechai the head. So the Haftore indicates that progression, how human beings behave, and therefore it's a lesson in leadership Uh, not only for the Jewish people, but generally in the world, really for all generations. Uh, next uh, Friday, if Purim, Shusham Purim, here in Yerushalayim, so there will not be a class. I want to wish you a happy Purim. Not having a class is part of having a happy Purim. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.